Good morning, everybody, uh, especially everybody joining us here in Europe. Good afternoon, everyone uh, who's joining us from Asia. And thank you to everybody joining us from the Middle East who's taking some time out of their lunch hour. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our series of client webinars focusing on the opportunities amidst what we think are, is a long cycle bull market in gold from here. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Norman Villeman. Uh, I'm the uh, Chief Investment Officer for Wealth Management here at UBP. And today I'm pleased to welcome back our own resident expert on gold, Peter Kinsella, who some of you will have met in our last uh, webinar, uh, where he outlined our case uh, for a long cycle bull market in gold. Uh, Peter's uh, returned to give us an update in light of the correction we've seen uh, over the last few weeks. And in addition, I'm really excited uh, to take our ongoing conversation on gold beyond just the metal itself and exploring the mining industry of the, this uh, precious metal in more detail with Evi Hambro. He's the co-manager of BlackRock's World Gold Fund, as well as the global head of thematic and sector-based investing for BlackRock. Evi has been investing in the market since 1994 with his remit extending beyond just gold miners, which we're gonna to cover today, but to the mining industry around the world, as well as the natural resources space. Um, just in terms of the agenda, Peter and Evi are going to set the stage for about the first 30 minutes or so. Uh, Peter providing an update uh, on our outlook for gold in light of the recent correction. Evi is first gonna provide a bit of context around the gold mining sector as a whole, and then share some insight as to how he and his team identify opportunities in the gold mining sector as a whole. We're then going to uh, address questions submitted by our audience. You can submit your questions at any time uh, during the webinar simply by typing your questions in the Q&A box. Or alternatively, if you're joining us by phone or if you prefer, you can submit your questions by email to investments at ubp.ch and we'll address them in the Q&A segment. Uh, before we kick off, just a reminder, because of cross-border rules, we're not able to speak about individual companies or particular products in this session. However, feel free to uh, follow up with your private banker or investment advisor, where we can get into more details on these topics in a private conversation. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter uh, for the Outlook on Gold. Thank you, Norman. Uh, good morning to all of our, our clients and colleagues in Europe. Uh, good afternoon to everybody in the Middle East and uh, I suppose a good evening to everybody in, uh, in, in Asia. So, as you know, um, I'm the, the Global Head of Foreign Exchange and, and Commodity Strategy here at UBP. And you will, of course, be very familiar with, uh, with our gold calls in, in, recent, uh, in recent years. So, today what I'm going to do, I'm going to give a brief update on recent price action in gold. And then I'll sort of look at the longer term drivers and uh, give our outlook uh, for where we think gold is, is going to be. I think I'll speak for between 10 and 15 minutes um, and I will try, of course, to speak quite slowly. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of give you as broad an overview about gold as we can. So I'll bring you to the next slide on the presentation. And we'll just go through sort of the, uh, the rather turbulent uh, last 18 months, which gold has, uh, has enjoyed. So we changed our view on gold in probably June of 2019, and we became much more bullish on the yellow metal at that time. And there were a number of reasons for us doing this. The first was that we saw coincidental monetary policy easing by both major emerging markets and emerging market central banks. We saw the likes of the Fed moving towards a rate cutting cycle, the ECB coming up with another rate cut, but additionally, a number of the smaller central banks, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, all moving towards a broad monetary easing policy. The same was true in emerging markets. We saw central banks in Turkey, Russia, India, and elsewhere, all of them cutting rates quite quickly and quite aggressively. And we saw sort of a, a paradigm or a previous regime like this in the, uh, the late 90s and after the global financial crisis when gold performed very, very well at that time. So we saw, we saw a similar picture developing, but of course it was a picture with some differences. We did note that, monet, that central banks were becoming increasingly unconventional with their monetary policy frameworks, with the reuse of uh, various tenders by, uh, by the European Central Bank, and in eventually further QE policies, as we saw in March of this year. Oops, and, and indeed, what we've seen in that time is that gold has, has responded much as we would have expected. We've seen that gold has really, really sort of uh, 
you know, increased pretty substantially from levels of around 1300 and, uh, you know, in May of 20, uh, 2019, up to recent highs of around $2,075. Of course, in recent weeks, we have seen the gold price decline modestly back to levels of just around sort of 1870 or thereabouts. And on the next slide, I'll explain why and what's happened. What we saw in, in September were kind of two or three um, coincident events, which have basically uh, affected the gold price. The first was that we saw the US Federal Reserve at its September meeting refusing to engage in further stimulus measures. Additionally, we saw the US uh, fiscal uh, situation <clears throat> not really improve in the context that US politicians were unable to come to an agreement about a so-called second stimulus program. Consequently, we saw that risky assets declined as investors took some, uh, some chips off the table. And because sort of long gold and indeed long euro dollar were both highly positioned and indeed heavily consensual positions, natural um, risk reduction policies led to modest uh, declines in the gold price. So certainly what we saw was that uh, risk reversals, which we use as a measure or a barometer of uh, sentiment towards, uh, towards gold, they started to decline a little bit. And that really just indicates that gold is no longer really the one-way trade, which it has been over the, last, no, over the last 18 months. Moving to the following slide, we basically look at the broader sort of longer term picture. And whilst we have a little, a small lack of, um, I would say upward drivers in the short term, the longer term drivers for gold are still very, very relevant and are still in, very much in play. The first point to note is that we have a negative real interest rate regime in much of the, in much of the developed and increasingly in the developing world. The chart on the left hand side shows you the, the, that real, real interest rates are highly, highly negative in the United States, obviously in, in New Zealand, uh, Turkey and elsewhere. And this is really sort of a situation which is likely to persist for a very prolonged period of time. At its last, uh, last meeting, um, the US Central Bank effectively moved towards so-called average inflation targeting framework. And what that means is that the Fed is not going to raise rates when inflation increases. What they're going to say is that they will allow for periods of inflation to overshoot in order to compensate for the last sort of decade of inflation undershoots. What that's really telling you is that gold now offers very, very fantastic asymmetric protection for any investment portfolio. And indeed, as and when, or if we do get inflation, at that point, uh, you were looking at a period of, let's say, compounded negative real interest rate returns for other asset classes. And of course, gold will, will perform very, very well in that situation. So certainly the, the large fundamental driver of gold being this sort of, a, you know, this hedge against a negative real rate regime is still in play in a very, very large extent. Moving to the following slide, we can then look at sort of the, the other drivers of the gold price. The chart on the left-hand side shows the development of broad money growth, known as USM2, in the United States. And what we can see is that that broad money growth is increasing, it has increased very substantially in the last year, and it is likely to continue increasing over the coming year as the Fed continues with its, uh, with its broad quantitative easing policies. Similar sort of dynamics are seen in the, in the Eurozone with the ECB's uh, quantitative easing policy, and of course in, in the UK with the Bank of England's easing policy. We're also noting similar, um, similar trends in other um, developed markets. Likewise, um, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, intervening with its, uh, its yield curve control policy, and of course with Japan. So we are seeing this, this period of massive increases in broad money growth, and indeed a very, very loose monetary policy framework by the major central banks. The chart on the right hand side, once again showing, the, showing us the development of the negative rate profile in the United States. As and when we get to back to levels of normal inflation of one and a half, and maybe even 2%, that negative rate profile will become more pronounced. So again, this is a very, very strong driver of the gold price over the coming years. Moving to the following slide, we can then look at, um, at sort of, uh, you know, the, the broad expansion of the, uh, the Fed's uh, balance sheet. And of course, the, the chart on the left hand side, simply, simply showing you how that balance sheet has reacted and how gold has reacted towards changes in the Fed's balance sheet. In terms of overall valuations, we think sort of gold is roughly trading where we would anticipate it to trade. Our models um, indicate, and they're based off sort of the development of US real interest rates, US uh, broad money growth, inflation expectations, 
and, and uh, dollar valuations. And broadly speaking, um, gold is in line with what our models sort of indicate. What that tells us is that gold is, is unlikely to decline very significantly from current levels. So although we've seen a, a modest down move from levels of around sort of 2000 back to current levels just below $1,900 per ounce, we think there's not really an awful lot of downside for the gold price going forward. Moving to the following slide, um, where we're just briefly going to talk about silver. Um, and indeed, uh, silver, of course, has caught up with, with gold. Um, regular sort of readers of our research will know that we, uh, in July, issued a paper on, on silver in which we argued that silver was ready to, uh, to correct very aggressively to the upside. And that's exactly what silver did. Um, silver at the time was deeply undervalued compared to gold, as you can see from the gold-silver ratio on the right-hand side. And that ratio is now trading at much more normal or normalized levels. So really, in a sense, what that's telling us is that sort of silver has caught up with gold. And, um, and we think going forward, it's likely to sort of continue gradually uh, rising, as we will explain on the following slide. What we can see um, really on the chart from the chart on the right hand side is that silver tends to correlate with the development of broad manufacturing indices and indeed broad manufacturing growth, um, which of course is surprised to the upside in recent months as the global economy has recovered. And indeed, we think this will continue over the longer term. Um, uh, silver, of course, is used very heavily in the construction of, the, of solar panels and in, in, in that industry. And of course, that's going to be a very significant long-term uh, driver price growth for silver. And overall, we think that silver should uh, get back to levels of around $32 to $35 per ounce over the coming, over the coming year. Just to kind of wrap up really on, uh, on, on the overall gold and silver outlook, the gold, of course, we are very, very constructive on, on the yellow metal. We think that it's fairly valued at current levels. We do anticipate that gold will, will continue to rise, probably, probably to levels of around $2,200 per ounce by the end of 2020, sorry, by the end of 2021. We think that there are upside risks to the gold price. And those risks emanate from the potential for further aggressive monetary policy easing measures from the major central banks. If we see any of the central banks move towards an outright or explicit helicopter money policy, which involves simply printing money and crediting the accounts of individuals or deficit engaging in deficit financing or governments, we think that gold could rapidly rise in that scenario. And of course, gold offers tremendous tail risk protection for any of the various geopolitical risks which exist in the world. So we are still fundamentally bullish on gold. We think that the modest down move we've seen in recent weeks is unlikely to, uh, to, to drop much further, and our model values do indicate that gold is more or less fairly valued at current prices. And uh, with that, I will then pass the, uh, the presentation over to Evie, and I'll thank you for your, your questions and your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, and, uh, and, and thank you um, to everybody at UVP for having me here today. It's a huge pleasure uh, to be able to talk about a subject that's incredibly close uh, to my heart, having done this now for, for, for many years. So if we could um, just set the scene by moving to the next slide. Um, and I think it's uh, obviously having heard this uh, very, very encouraging backdrop uh, from Peter with regards to uh, the gold price, um, and which we uh, agree with. Uh, obviously, the, the very, very uh, tight correlations um, between gold and many of the macro kind of fundamentals that are driving the market um, today is really a kind of uh, uh, just about the most bullish environment that I've seen in, in doing this job for, for 26 years. If somebody had said to me um, some time ago um, that we would have seen negative uh, real rates uh, in the US uh, in an almost zero interest rate uh, environment with the US 10-year trading as low as it is today, I, I would have found it hard to believe. Um, and um, the thought that gold um, could have gone up almost 10 times in value over the last 20, 20 years is, again, would have been hard for anybody to forecast, but it just shows you the kind of the, the, the world that we are now in. Um, what we do is we invest not just in physical gold, but we invest in the, in the gold companies um, that uh, produce the metal through mining around the world. Uh, and they have a, a lot of characteristics that investors uh, are searching for um, at the moment. Um, typically, um, they give you exposure um, to the gold price, um, because if the gold price goes up or down, the, the profitability of a company 
uh, will change and that will be reflected in its, its equity valuation. The amount that they move up or down depends on how profitable the companies are. So the companies that are at break-even levels of profitability for a small change in the price, that has a tremendous impact on the profits of a company and therefore it will have a very high sensitivity. Um, companies that are already very profitable, if the price continues to rise, um, the beta will, won't be as much as the ones that were more marginal. Um, companies are able to generate value through lots of different sources. So we're often asked, how does a gold equity compare um, to a gold bar? Um, and you know, one of the ways that a gold company can generate value for its shareholders is to be able to increase production. Uh, it can discover new sources of, of, of gold. It can do merger and acquisition activity that can be uh, value accretive. Uh, and it can also pay you a dividend. And that's something that's really starting to capture people's imagination in the uh, gold equity space right now because of the dividend destruction that we've seen in broader equity markets, whether it's the financial regulators restricting banks from paying dividends or the oil companies that were such a core part of people's income portfolios that have now had to massively cut uh, their income uh, and dividends that they're paying out or or even um, the, 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 the companies that are no longer uh, attractive with ESG lenses, such as tobacco and, and alcohol, that are now being kind of curtailed in terms of exposure. To see gold companies um, now starting to pay dividend yields, and we'll come on to this later, that are uh, in line, if not higher, than the broader market uh, is actually uh, capturing uh, in investor attention. Uh, and I think the last thing that we should touch on outside of this is of one of the things that we do in our investment process. Uh, is a very, very uh, strict ESG lens that we use uh, in terms of the, uh, um, the, the the stock selection. So if we just uh, uh, touch on uh, where uh, we invest uh, at the kind of in terms of the life cycle um, of, of a mining company, and you can see this on the on the slide um, showing a series of photographs um, to, to, uh, to, 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 to highlight the different points of, uh, of entry uh, and also risk. Uh, clearly, the riskiest part of the gold equity universe is in the small cap companies, uh, and these tend to be uh, companies that are not yet uh, in production. Uh, they tend to be companies that are still exploring or, or looking uh, for commodities in the ground. They raise capital from investors, uh, high risk capital. Uh, and I would say that 99 times out of 100, the companies tend to fail. Um, they don't tend to find what they are looking for. Uh, despite all of the promises of treasure, um, and they disappoint investors. Uh, then as you go through the, the stages of development from uh, exploration success uh, through to constructing a mine, uh, to being a, a mid-sized company, to being a large uh, a gold producer, and finally, uh, what we call uh, the royalty companies. Now, we invest throughout this spectrum. We have very small exposure to uh, the explorers. Uh, we have technical background uh, on our team um, with uh, geological uh, training skills and metallurgical and engineering training skills that allow us to assess those risks on the explorers and the developers uh, and hopefully avoid some of the ones that are likely to, to disappoint. We also have financial uh, expertise as well, which allows us to evaluate the cash flows uh, that companies are generating once they're in uh, production. And then lastly, on the royalty companies, these are a really interesting group um, to look at. These companies own a legal right to a share of the revenue that is generated by a mining company when it's operating on a specific lease area. Uh, and so that's a, a government regulated uh, document um, that if a company is producing gold or copper or other commodities, they will have a specific share. And normally these royalties are created when the asset is first discovered. And the geologist, uh, the pioneer uh, who discovered, who makes that first discovery when he sells um, out um, the business um, to the developer or to the bigger company, uh, in order to retain some upside, normally they will keep a royalty so that if the asset continues to grow, um, they don't look foolish for having sold it uh, too early. And these royalties are very valuable because uh, as an asset grows and, uh, and expands, the royalty company doesn't need to provide additional capital, um, but it still has the same share of revenue uh, as long as the commodity is being produced uh, on the license areas. Uh, and we also have a mixture of those companies in, in our portfolios. In terms of our investment process, uh, obviously uh, it's a, it is a, an investment process that moves around. 
uh, and evolves through time. Um, but the key for us is obviously uh, a variety of things. First of all, you know, on the risk side, um, it, one of the things we think that's unique that we do uh, is get out into the field and visit mining companies uh, around the world. Uh, seeing those assets firsthand um, is, is, a, is an incredible opportunity to assess uh, risk uh, and also to see uh, what the scope is for value upside um, as well. It allows you to engage with management. It allows you to engage with communities and local regulators to see whether a company is welcomed into a specific area. And that really is it comes down to uh, what we think about in terms of the social license to operate. Uh, does a company actually have that social license despite having the legal right to be there? Have they earned the credibility with the local communities uh, to be able to be welcomed uh, into, the, into that part of the world to, to run their assets? Are they giving back to the communities? Are they training? Are they providing healthcare and education, uh, infrastructure and, and, and paying local um, taxes? This is all part of that due diligence part that we do in terms of our bottom-up uh, research. Obviously, the company meetings and financial modeling uh, is a core part of that as well. The top-down research really extends into areas that Peter's been speaking about before, uh, where we look to see some of the macro trends in terms of what's driving commodity markets. Um, and, and again, a variety of other factors that kind of influence the outlook for commodity prices. We bring those two those areas together, the bottom up research and the top down research. We scan our investment universe um, through a whole range of different tools that we have with, with regards to the BlackRock data uh, analytical teams. And then we build our portfolio depending upon what kind of outlook we have, whether we're bullish or bearish and what kind of beta we want the portfolio um, to have. And we do that in conjunction with our risk oversight teams um, at BlackRock. Um, I just want to uh, mention a couple of slides in, in terms of the company fundamentals um, that, uh, that we're seeing right now. So on the next slide, you'll see um, an incredible trend of earnings growth uh, coming through for the companies. Now, this is not obviously company specific. What we've done here is taken uh, a variety of, uh, of cost bases across the industry. And we've looked at uh, the improvement in margins that the companies are generally enjoying. Now, what we're seeing right now is, a, is an absence of cost inflation, uh, which is protecting margins because historically we've often had rising commodity prices and rising costs and margins haven't expanded as fast as investors might have wished for. Today, we're in an environment of minimal inflation uh, and elevated and rising uh, commodity prices. So we're seeing huge uh, increases in profitability. Now, in the past, you might have worried that mining company management would have gone out and uh, and poorly allocated that capital into, into, into bad investment decisions. Today, the discipline within the sector as a whole is so robust that we're seeing this, this excess capital being returned back to investors because companies are not putting it into growth projects, uh, nor are they using it to pay down debt because most of the indebtedness of the sector has already been repaid uh, over the previous years. So this really should be a, a point of time of huge harvesting uh, for shareholders in terms of income. And that brings me on to the next slide where to give you some evidence, we've highlighted uh, a number of the most recent headlines uh, for companies where you know, it's almost uh, uh, on a kind of weekly basis, we are coming into, the, uh, coming into work and seeing um, you know, headlines around uh, the sector where companies are just uh, announcing you know, reap, uh, share buybacks or, or big dividend increases on the back of this increasing profitability. And it wouldn't surprise me in 2021 uh, if we had a, a, a very, very large uh, increase uh, in overall sector yield um, as the companies continue to enjoy that profitability. Like Peter said earlier on, we remain optimistic on the outlook for gold, uh, principally down to the macro environment but also due to the fundamentals where we see, you know, for example, in 2019, it was the first year in over a decade where gold production for the gold industry actually fell. Uh, and that's because of the long-term underinvestment into, into new sources of supply. Central banks continue to buy gold aggressively uh, for their reserves, uh, and those holdings continue to uh, increase. Uh, and so we are seeing these kind of fundamental trends uh, in the gold market combined with the macro uh, factors that Peter's mentioned that is just so supportive uh, to see these better prices. And then just lastly, in terms of valuations, uh, it would be remiss of me not to touch on this. Um, I just wanted to, to highlight um, that despite 
um, the moves that we've seen in share prices, which you know obviously have increased with today's higher prices. Uh, valuations across the sector are by no means extended. Uh, we are still seeing lots of value, whether it's looking at the price to NAV uh, within the sector or traditional metrics like PE multiples or EV to EBITDA, and also dividend yield multiples as well. I was mentioning earlier on how these are now rising uh, and they will be trending above market yields uh, as we go into 2021, which again is very encouraging from a valuation uh, factor. So just in terms of summary, uh, obviously gold companies um, carry additional risk um, because they are operating companies unlike a a gold bar itself, um, but that risk is compensated with dividends, growth potential, um, and uh, exposure to uh, all of the potential for exploration success and, and M&A uh, within, within the sector. Uh, the outlook is pretty robust um, because the companies have paid down a lot of their debt and the earnings growth that we're seeing should flow through into higher returns uh, to investors uh, because of the lack of additional claims uh, on those cash flows. Thank you very much. I hope that's been useful, and I believe that we might be able to have some questions now. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so again, if you have questions, we've already had a number submitted via the Q and A panel, or alternatively, feel free to submit them by email to investments at ubp dot ch. Or if you like, we can work with your private banker and or investment advisor um, and have private conversations on some of your issues. Uh, if you'd like to stay uh, in the loop in terms of our thoughts uh, on uh, different developments in the markets or uh, for uh, updates on other webinars that we're going to be having, please feel free to sign up um, uh, for, uh, uh, on our website. Uh, for delivery straight to your inbox on our latest thoughts. Again, Evie, Peter, uh, thank you for taking the time and sharing your insights with our clients. Uh, and we look forward to having you again. Thank you very much, everybody. It was thank great you. fun.